It's July 23rd, 2013. Here we go. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon. My name is Anthony Weiner, Democratic candidate for mayor of the city of New York. The Democratic frontrunner to become the next mayor of New York calling a press conference wouldn't normally be a national, much less international, news event, but Anthony Weiner isn't just any candidate for mayor. He has baggage. As I've said in the past, these things that I did were wrong and hurtful to my wife and caused us to go through many challenges in our marriage that extended past my resignation from Congress. That resignation was two years earlier when Anthony Weiner's promising political career had seemed over. It came from Congressman Anthony Weiner's Twitter account over the weekend, a photo of an anonymous man's bulging underwear. The lewd picture, immediately deleted from Weiner's account, was sent to this 21-year-old Seattle college student, but also available to the public to view on Twitter. Weiner initially denied he'd tweeted the photo of his <laughs> namesake. Uh, this seems like a prank that has gotten an enormous amount of attention. This is the picture. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it by now. Is this you? I can tell you this. We have a firm that we've hired to... I've seen it. It's... I've seen it. Yeah, like every time he looked down. For a few days, Weiner maintained he'd been hacked before admitting his lie. And his humiliation seemed complete. So today I'm announcing my resignation from Congress. Yeah! yeah! Bye -bye, so my colleagues can get back to work. My neighbours can choose a new representative. And most importantly, that my wife and I can continue to heal from the damage I have caused. And Anthony Weiner wasn't just any congressman either. A fixture on cable news, Weiner's wife, Huma Aberdeen, was one of the most trusted advisers to US Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. Anthony he Weiner. was still well connected and very ambitious and perhaps recognising his run for New York mayor was his last shot at redemption, this time he would not be quitting. I hope they are willing to still continue to give me a second chance and I hope they realise that in many ways um, what happened today was something that frankly had happened before but it doesn't represent all that much that is new. Nice try, but the latest sexts were from the year after he quit Congress. He'd been up to his old tricks again before running for mayor. Now he was trying to convince voters that was all in the past. Helping him to make that implausible claim was his wife, Huma Aberdeen. But this is the first time I've spoken at a press conference and um, you'll have to bear with me because I'm very nervous. She argued if she could forgive her husband's indiscretions, maybe voters should too. Our marriage, like many others, has had its ups and its downs. It took a lot of work and a whole lot of therapy to get to a place where I could forgive Anthony. The Clintons were reportedly concerned Weiner would prove to be a liability for them in the future. And while Bill and Hillary have not gone public, aides and advisors say they're eager to see Weiner exit the race before damage is done to a possible Clinton run for the presidency, reminding voters of the Clintons' own sex scandal, with Hillary Clinton standing by her man. I'm sitting here because I love him and I respect him. Come Democratic primary day, fewer than 5% of New Yorkers had forgiven Anthony Weiner enough to vote for him, and that seemed like maybe the last time we'd hear from him, except as the punchline to a joke. But then came the election of 2016. Huma Aberdeen is still by the side of Hillary Clinton, who seems destined to become the first female president, despite concerns she may have been a little lax with security using a private email account as Secretary of State. She was up against this guy. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh, I don't remember. He's going like, I don't remember. I, oh, maybe that's what I said. But then... Anthony Weiner in more trouble for him. Child Services is now investigating the former congressman after his latest round of sexting, which included a photo showing his young son in the background. And the saga still wasn't over. 11 days to the election, the FBI director informing lawmakers he is reviewing new emails related to the Clinton email investigation. Law enforcement officials tell CNN the new emails were not from Clinton, but were sent and received by aide Huma Abedin. They were found on a device shared by...
by Aberdeen and her estranged husband, Anthony Weiner, who was the target of a separate investigation into alleged sexting with a minor. Wow. Wow, indeed. It's true. It seems Anthony Weiner is forcing the nation to relitigate the entire email controversy and putting Hillary Clinton's chances of winning the presidency in serious danger. The FBI found nothing new relating to their Clinton email investigation on Weiner's laptop, but the damage was done. It reminded enough voters about the Clinton scandals, the secrecy, the lies, the email affair, 25 years of it. Pollsters say Comey's brief reopening of the Clinton investigation was the final straw, sending Donald Trump to the White House. Meanwhile, Anthony Weiner was sent to jail for a year and a half for sexting with a minor, and he remains a registered sex offender for life. So, what was it like to be at the centre of that storm, and indeed all of the storms, from Lewinsky Gate through to Weiner Gate? Huma Aberdeen has written her side of those stories and more in her new memoir, Both and A Life in Many Worlds, where she goes back to her childhood, growing up Muslim in Michigan and then Saudi Arabia, her path to the White House and what she calls Hillary Land, and then, of course, the collision of very public and private events. Huma Aberdeen, welcome to Planet America. John, thank you for having me on the show. I'm looking forward to our conversation. You write in your book about a fundraiser you attended with then First Lady Hillary Clinton in October 1998. Well, she's feeling a lot of pressure around the impeachment of her husband. Why was that night so significant when it came to your future working relationship? Well, you know, I tell the story in the book. I take the readers through my experience of walking into the White House in 1996 as a 21-year-old intern, uh, having no idea what I was getting myself into, having goosebumps as I walk into the residence, down the red carpet, up the marble uh, staircases. I mean, I it was literally a, a pinch-me moment from the minute I walked in. But it did, my time at the White House and the Clinton administration uh, did coincide with some momentous uh, historic moments in our country. I and mean, that included things like the you know, Middle East peace efforts. It did include uh, the experience of, of impeachment. And I wrote about um, that, uh, that, in, you know, that entire ordeal because all of the big moments in that investigation seemed to match uh, these milestones in my time with uh, Hillary Clinton. And um, so that night was in the midst of a, a very challenging time for our country, certainly for the Democratic Party. And I write this story of just, you know, newly traveling with Hillary Clinton as a young staff person, very insecure in my job, not sure I knew what I was doing, intimidated by the surroundings. And one night at, uh, at a dinner, at a fundraising dinner, I ask her a question and she responds by saying, this is not working and returns a plate. She'd picked up a plate to, to pick up a buffet dinner. And I thought, this is horrible. I've lost my job. I've made some mistakes over the last few weeks. And uh, so I recount the scene of driving back in that limousine to the White House, thinking this is my last, it's October of 1998. I hadn't even been traveling with her for a year and thinking, wow, it's all over. And when she gets back into the residence, she calls me in and gives me a hug and says, you know, I'm sorry for what I said. It, um, you know, it's been a very difficult time for all of us. And I just want you to know I appreciate everything you do. And I tell the story in the book, John, because to me, it really revealed something about her humanity, her empathy, the kindness that she shows to people, even in the most stressful of times. And I was on the opposite end of that uh, that that night. When you first started working with Hillary Clinton in 1998, she had literally just found out that her husband had lied to her and indeed the nation about his affair with Monica Lewinsky. When you, many years later, found yourself in a not dissimilar public scandal because of your husband, Anthony Weiner, uh, did you draw on that experience at all or did you see them as sort of entirely different? You know, I didn't because I think no two uh, situations are necessarily the same or even comparable. I, I think what she was going through uh, was a historic, uh, had, you know, every decision she made, the stress and the pressure upon her was uh, overwhelming. And when I had to go through my own personal challenges many years later, 
uh, you know, I, in that moment, I was so stunned and so shocked. I just tried to do the next best right thing for myself. I, you know, it was such different circumstances. You know, I was newly married. I was, you know, I tell the story of waking up at Buckingham Palace and knowing I was, you know, newly pregnant, carrying my secret, living this perfect life, having married the man who I believed was the love of my life. He was my, certainly my first love. He was the first man I had ever been with. Uh, so for me, it was just this earth shattering, shocking revelation, but, uh, you know, I had to manage my way through and it took several years to, to get through, to get through that process, to be able to be here sitting with you and being on the other side, having written this book and happy to have shared my story. In our introduction there, Huma, we just saw a, a clip of you at that press conference standing by the side of your husband, Anthony Weiner, when he was running for mayor in 2013 and speaking out in his defence. You said at the time you were very nervous. How hard was that to do for you? Well, taking people back to that moment, you know, I think there is a tendency to look at my relationship with Anthony from a 2021 perspective, and hindsight is certainly 2020. Um, but in the moment, you know, I was, as I said, just trying to do what I thought was the next best right thing. And I also didn't understand, you know, John, I don't believe what I went through is necessarily so singular. Unfortunately, I think it is something that women and couples and people go through challenges in their relationships. Infidelity did not, was not invented in, uh, in my case. I just had to do it on the front page of the newspaper. And you know, as I recount in the book, um, you know, as we were doing research for this book, my colleague came to me and said, the most common headline about you from that period of time is what is wrong with her and what is she thinking? And so I chose to write exactly what I was thinking. And, you know, in the 2013, I stood at that press conference because I had agreed, encouraged Anthony to run the, the first time the scandal had broken. I had you know, thought it was this anomaly. I didn't understand the behavior. I thought it was something he could easily knock off. And I saw him running for office as a way to, you know, re uh, uh, reestablish himself in society and the community. He was a good public servant. He was a very popular member of Congress uh, before he resigned in 2011. And I saw this as a path back. It was a mistake in hindsight for him to run. But I stood with him because I had uh, I had felt like I owed people an answer and I had to take responsibility for my decision. I wonder, I mean, it happened to Hillary Clinton in the 1990s. It happened to you more recently, this idea that for standing by your husband, you were somehow to blame or complicit or responsible for his infidelities and his scandals. What do you think that is about? Well, I think in part, you know, I can only speak from my own experience, but I do know that when we um, had, when Anthony and I went through this shock in our marriage, this crisis, as I write in the book, in our marriage, I didn't, you know, I didn't know how to deal with it. I'd never, you know, I didn't grow up in the a family. You know, I came from an immigrant family, came to this country to pursue the American dream. I grew up in Saudi Arabia. It was not an environment where we went to talk to strangers about our problems. And, and I had nothing, I didn't know any parents uh, who were divorced uh, when I was growing up in Saudi Arabia. It was a, this was entirely a new, uh, a new space and place for me to explore. I did feel as though, you know, we were in a bunker together uh, right at the beginning. You know, you, you know, the disinviting from parties, the being asked, you know, volunteering at a food bank and being asked not to come. And so, yes, I mean, the shunning to some extent, certainly I had a very supportive family and a very, very supportive group of friends, but nobody really knew what to do or how to help us. I mean, sort of they were just there to be there, but in terms of seeking professional help, that's something we had to do on our own. And it also took a very long time to understand the behavior. I think mental health, you know, in part, as I've had been on this book tour around the country, I have to tell you, John, every single day I will meet somebody or get a message from somebody who says they understand. And people who will say, I don't understand. It is in in, in my opinion, people who, um, or in my judgment, people who just never had to live with somebody, don't have a partner or a parent or a child who's either dealt um, with mental health issues or addiction, you know, addictive behavior. Um, and it took me many years to, you know, understand what I was dealing with and, you know, who I was living with uh, before, before I understood as to why society judges that way. I mean, I, I sort of, I end the book about one of the many reasons I write the book is, 
for my son, but also not allowing cycles to repeat themselves and how, how we raise our children to feel loved and trusted and supported no matter what. But um, I, uh, I can only say I was able to get through it. I, we were able to get through the other side. You know, this man is the father of my child, so he will always be in my life. And we've had to figure out a path forward. It's been work, a lot of work. I, I, I write in detail about how difficult the work was, but for us, it was the right decision. Can, can you explain to us what your feelings were in 2016 at the height of this campaign where your boss of almost 20 years, who's now more of a friend, is about to become, it seems, the first female president of the United States. Your husband's laptop computers and his old sexting scandal suddenly mean Jim Comey opens up an investigation once again and it costs her the election. How mortifying was that? Well, you know, 2016, uh, and I share the stories in the book about what it felt, you know, that night in uh, Philadelphia in July 28th, 2016, when Hillary Clinton was officially the first uh, female presidential nominee of our party, I, uh, I recounted how the feeling in the room, the pounding on the floor was so intense, I thought we were going to fall through the energy, the excitement, the history she had just made for generations of women and girls in this country that, you know, something we could carry forward with a tremendous amount of pride. There was so much excitement. So yes, for 11 days, before our election for this unprecedented announcement from the then FBI director in an election that was this close, every little thing mattered and this was a big thing. And there were already plenty of external forces as you know, Hillary has recounted herself in her own book, everything from foreign government intervention, so from to challenge, you know, fake ads on social media. I mean, it was the incoming was constant. I write a whole uh, passage in the book about the sexism, the constant sexist remarks she had to endure. It was constantly challenges thrown at her, the fake news that was just prevalent, people we'd run into who would believe these rumors that she was dying or some horrible, you know, accusations that we just dismissed as nonsense. All of these things were seeded in that election. So this final earthquake um, was devastating. And then for two days before, uh, for, for there to be a, another announcement saying there is nothing new and there's nothing to report, uh, I think uh, hurt us even more. It was, it was so traumatic, so devastating, as I write in the book. I had even, I was so stunned I had stopped feeling because feeling for myself felt selfish in that moment. It was about the mission. It was about November 8th. It was about getting her elected. And we all know how that ended. Huma Aberdeen, when you hear people say, Hillary Clinton, she didn't win the presidency either time she ran because she's just not likeable. She rubs people up the wrong way. Uh, what do you put that down to? Is that, is that her gender? Is it something about her personality? Is it something about the rest of us? What do you think? Well, you know, it's one of the many reasons I wrote the book. You know, as I say in the end of the book, I, you know, I try to approach this book as a show, not tell. It's not telling you this and telling you that. I try to show people what it was like. I take people onto Air Force One with us. I take people into the Situation Room or into the meetings at the State Department. What were the motivations of this woman? Or actually, whether it was Hillary Clinton or Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, all of whom I had the privilege to serve with, what, you know, revealing the kind of, and John McCain, even the other side of the aisle, Lindsey Graham, Republican senators who, um, you know, who uh, Hillary worked with, this idea of what American leaders, what motivated them, their values and their principles, which I hope I have done justice to in the book, uh, I tell a story in 2016 about traveling to a fundraiser, uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the, the campaign, a surrogate as we call it. And as I gave the speech, and I was very nervous about public speaking, I'm terrified of public speaking. I um, I finish, I just get up and give a personal story. And when I, when I finish, one of the audience members gets up and says, I don't understand why doesn't Hillary talk about herself this way? I mean, these stories are amazing. And I said then, which is what I still believe, is that she never believed it was about her. She was a serious, you know, policy-driven. She was solution-driven. Everything about what animated her got her up in the morning was how do I make every man, woman, and child in this country's life better, easier, more prosperous, and more fair. And she, for the most part, ignored the little personal, you know, uh, attacks. And for many years that worked in the 1990s, you know, what, John, when I grew up in the Clinton world of politics in the 1990s, it was just the beginning of the 24-hour cable news uh, shows. 
you had a proactive message you drove every single day. So whether that was healthcare or education, that was the message you talked about every day and you ignored any of the nonsensical fake news that might be percolating. Now, as we learned in 2016, we live in a 24 second news cycle. So you, you have, and, and as you know, I think we learned late, you have to respond, you have to counter attack. You can't, you cannot assume people are not going to believe nonsense because as we learned in the aftermath of 2016, people believed plenty of nonsense in this country. And I hope when you close this book that you will see, and I hope I've done a good job that, you know, she would have been an extraordinary president of the United States and not because she was the most qualified woman to run in this country, because I believe she was the most qualified person. And Huma, a constant backdrop in your memoir is your late father, who died just before you headed off to college and then to work in the White House and, and for Hillary Clinton. At the end of that, when you're writing this memoir after a pretty extraordinary 25 years in your life, did you reconnect with your father and some of the, the lessons that he at least tried to teach you uh, when he was still alive? John, absolutely. I mean, ultimately, this book holistically is a love letter to my father. It is, if I had an opportunity to have one more conversation with my dad, this is what I would give him. I would give him this book and say, this is what I did with my life, and I hope you're proud of me. And when people would ask me in my adult sort of trials and you know tribulations, what, how are you so resilient? How did you get through? It is the reason the whole first part of the book is about my mother and my father, who, as I said, you know, gave up their countries, came to the United States. My father was diagnosed with renal failure when I was two. And one of the very first lines I typed when I wrote this book was my father was told he was dying and he went out and lived. And he was my age, 46, when he was diagnosed with renal failure. And I think about the extraordinary things that he did in all the years that he had left. We moved to Saudi Arabia. My parents took us all over the world. My father always told me that our eyes are at the front of our heads for a reason. It is to look forward. So he wanted me to learn history, but he only wanted me to learn it in the context of, you know, informing decisions we made in the future. And I always believed that my father thought I would be a writer. He, um, I tell, I share a story about um, being given Silas Marner. My father brought us books back from his travels all the time, and he gave me Silas Marner when I was 10, and I did not understand the material, and I asked my father, why did Marianne Evans use a man's name, George Eliot, to write? And my father said, in the Victorian era, women were not taken seriously as writers, so she used a man's name, but don't worry. When you write your book, you will use your own name and everyone will take it seriously. And I really do honor the past. My parents, my grandmother, who demanded to be educated over 100 years ago at a time when none of the women in her environment or so social circle were being educated. When I think about traveling to Macedonia and meeting Kosovar Muslim women, going to Iraq during the war and meeting with women there, I think about the privilege, the extraordinary privilege I have had, and I really do owe it to my, you know, my forebears for giving me this 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 life. I, you know, I've had some more pinch me moments than I can count, but in the end, I really owe it all to my mother and my father, and I hope they're proud of me. All of which, Huma, I guess, invites a question about your own plans for the future now. Uh, the assumption is Hillary Clinton's never running for president again. She's effectively retired, as is Bill Clinton. So uh, are you now going to pursue that dream of becoming the, the next Christiane Amanpour? Are you going to be writing more books like this? Uh, what does the future hold, do you think? You know, I did. One of the, my father's uh, pieces of advice was uh, good life is a balanced life. For most of my life, I did not follow that advice. I worked all the time and everything else came second, and I am enjoying finding more balance in my life. I love that I can add author to my resume. I, I say that with a tremendous amount of pride. I stole from Shonda Rhimes this idea that this was going to be my year of saying yes, as she said, when she wrote her memoir. And I really, you know, I think I was very, you know, controlled and closed and very single, you know, single-minded, you know, for most of my professional life, that I am, I really am open to any new adventures, I mean, you know, Christian interviewed me last week. I was so nervous. I was shaking, but I was so excited to talk to her. And who knows, maybe I can still be Christian Amanpour. I'm exploring every opportunity and, I, I'm, and I'm excited about every opportunity. You know, John, I'm doing the thing with you right now that scares me the most. And that's the advice I give. I'm, I meet students and young women all over the country here. And, uh, and that's the that's the advice that I give them. Do the thing that scares you the most. You never know. It might be worth it. And I have been 
amazed at how much I've enjoyed this book tour, being in conversation with people like you, and sharing my story. Huma Aberdeen, a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for being with us on Planet America. John, thrilled to be talking to you. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it.